In this nugget, we're going to break one of the first myths about Scrum, and that Scrum doesn't estimate. Scrum is just about developing. There absolutely is estimating in Scrum. We've touched on it already in this series, and Scrum estimating is all about developing this thing called story points, or the effort to complete a story. which is really the first point we're going to discuss in this nugget, is how do we determine the effort to complete a story, recognizing that Scrum is nimble, lightweight, and so on. So yes, there is no function point estimating. There is no algor algorithmic estimating in Scrum, because Scrum is nimble and lightweight, but we will definitely discuss how we go about estimating the effort to complete a story and create these things called story points. In this nugget, we'll again very quickly touch on velocity, which is simply a count of the number of story points per scrum, or per sprint rather. And we'll introduce you to two methods for estimating in scrum. One is the estimating game, and the other is planning poker. But first, let's talk about what and how we go about estimating the effort to complete a story in Scrum. And as discussed, in Scrum, we absolutely need to determine the effort to estimate the story, which boils down to the number of hours of work required to complete the story. There's no getting around that. That's what we're about doing when we start Scrum estimating. But we need the, to do this in a very lightweight method. As I said, we're not going to do function point estimating. We're not going to do complex algorithmic estimating because that would not be consistent with a Scrum approach. But we need to determine the hours to complete the story and as we discussed in a previous nugget, it is very tedious to say, for this story, analysis is going to take 1.5 hours, and design is going to take 0.75 hours, and development is going to take 2.5 hours, and testing is going to take 1.25 hours for a total of that again is not lightweight and nimble. Yes, it will come up with an estimate for our hours to complete the story, but again, it is very tedious. And we would spend probably almost as much time coming up with these estimates and the implied degree of precision associated with these estimates that belies, that, that actually flies in the face of what we want to be with Scrum, which is lightweight. And why I say the degree of precision, if we're coming up with estimates that says an hour and a half, three quarters of an hour, an hour and a quarter, that certainly implies a lot of precision. And you can say, well, I can get around that by simply saying analysis is going to be two, design is going to be one, development is going to be three, and testing is going to be two by doing the roundup. But by doing that, we have significantly inflated our estimate, recognizing that a story should be completed in one to two days on average. So again, we need to find a more lightweight way of doing that. And I've already introduced you to that. It's we do it in relativity to others. So we have a story and we have a known effort. So this story took 12 hours to complete. And we begin to develop all of our other estimates relative to that one. So that one story took 12 hours. If we look at a new story, we look it over and say, you know, it's probably going to take about the same amount of analysis. Design is probably a little bit more. Development could be, again, a little bit more. So it should be 15 hours. 
and you can do that. But again, if you're taking it back to doing your estimating and saying, okay, analysis about the same, design is a little bit more, again, we're probably putting a degree of precision into that estimate that again is not very scrum-like and again probably has an implied degree of precision that if the original estimate was 0.75 hours to feed into this 12 hour estimate what's a little bit more is it 13 is it 15 again yes we could do it but we're putting more effort again more implied precision than we probably want so again what we've come up with with Scrum is this thing called the story point. And we'll discuss what a story point really is in more detail in just a moment, but a story point is that standard measure. I.e. a story point could be equivalent of 12 hours. So we say this story with the known effort is one story point and if we look at the next story and we say it's a little bit bigger it may be one and a half story points for example the problem with that again is we get into again more implied degree of precision so to develop a relative sizing in story points in scrum we'll often refer to this thing called the Fibonacci numbers and I apologize if I haven't pronounced that correctly. What is a Fibonacci number? It is a mathematical sequence that you take the number one, and then you take the number two because it's the next in sequence, and the next number in sequence is the sum of those two. So the next number is three, sum two and three together, the next number will be five, sum those together, the number will be eight, sum those number, it will be 13, and finally, 21 and it'll go on for infinity of course. I'm stopping at, stopping at that point in time because we want our stories to be relatively small so therefore I would suggest taking the Fibonacci numbers out as far as a 21 story point is probably far in excess of an actual realistic story. A story that has a degree of effort or a relative sizing of 21 probably is actually an epic and probably needs to be broken down. So some people prefer to do our degree of precision that way. Another one I've often seen used is the whole concept of two exponential. The first story is one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, and 32, and so on. And again, I'd probably do my break point at least at the 16. The whole idea is to get a relative to size. Fibonacci numbers give us the relative size. The problem a lot of people see with this sequence is in the low range, it's still very close. Is this story a one or is this story a two? And can result in a lot of debate. Or is this story really a three? And it's again, it's the relative packing of the first numbers in the sequence. The two exponential helps us a little bit. Yes, we still have the argument, is it a one or a two? But it begins to space out much more quickly. It's a four, it's an eight, it's a 16. So using one of these two methods to do our relative sizing, if we're looking at the new story and we say it's almost the same as the known story, we have to make a decision. Is it in fact the same as the known story? In which case it is also going to be a one story point because in this method we aren't allowed to get into fractional story points or is it big enough that it actually becomes a two story point? And then again as we, we go out in our sequences it begins to really begin to eliminate the subjectivity is this a 5 or is this an 8 or is this a 13 and you will very quickly find your team when you're out in these ranges very quickly saying yes it's an 8 it's really definitely bigger than a 5 or it's really bigger than a 
equivalent story that had a story point count of five. So therefore, it has to be an eight. And again, a lot of people suggest that the the rapid, the more rapid advancement of the sequence actually supports better story point estimating. A last point on effort to estimate a story. Some stories really aren't going to be just like. When we're doing this relative sizing, we're typically thinking of coding stories where we go through our life cycle. Some of the stories are going to be non-coding stories. They're going to be documentation stories. They're going to be training stories. They're going to be exploratory. Let's just do a little bit of R&D. The general suggestion is for these non-coding stories, let's just do a time box. Let's assign all non-coding stories a time box of four story points. And we will simply do the amount of effort that four story points allows us to do. Otherwise, as we know, a lot of these activities, document, training, exploration, can literally be exponential in their own right and go on and on forever. So again, a very common approach is simply to time box, pick an arbitrary number, three story points, four story points, depending on which sequence we're using, and saying all known coding stories are going to be of that time box and stop work when the story point completion is done or story point consumption is done. If you still need more documentation, you create a new story. So how do we pick what that arbitrary point is? What is a story point? What is that comparative baseline? The most common approach for determining what is the size of a story point, what is our comparative baseline, is find what would be considered the smallest story that your project is ever going to take on and assign that to be one story point. So let's say we had a very simple menu. If we find the most simplest menu in our system, we simply assign that to be a single story point and therefore we begin to do all our comparison off of that. Well, here's a menu, but this menu is much more complex because this menu is going to require extra user input besides selecting a one, two, three, four. So therefore that is twice as complex as the simple menu. So it's going to be two story points and so on. Most common method is to pick the smallest story. Another method I have seen to some success is pick it as the average story. So sometimes, yes, we have a number of these simples. Um, and if we try to do everything comparative to a simple, so probably easy to say the simple menu versus the more complex menu, because we were able to say it's not just the selection of the number, it's also the entry of customer ID and begin to make it relative to that. But as we get into more detailed business stories, sometimes it's harder to do a direct comparison to that most simplistic program or simplistic story. So therefore, again, some projects prefer to say, let's pick an average story. Most stories are going to involve a degree of data entry, a degree of edit, so therefore, I'll pick an average story and assign it to be my story point and then build and do my comparisons off of that. If you take this approach of satisfying it as an average story, our 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 approach breaks down because if our story point is an average, yes, we can build up. This is a, a larger than average. This is a complex and this is a very complex story, but we will then need to have some way to also scale this down for a half, a quarter, and maybe a tenth. And again, I'm breaking my rule that says story points are always in even numbers. They're in even numbers unless we set our comparative baseline as a average as opposed to a smallest. So to me, I prefer this method, 
But the downfall to this method is, again, I need to have my sliding scale on a fractional basis to support those very simple. Or there are those that says, no, Steve, don't take that approach. I still like your approach of saying a story point is an average story. And if I have the simplistic menu, I'll still assign it a story point of one, recognizing that it simply builds a little buffer into my overall project. And if you take that and recognizing that an average story is going to build in buffer for the truly simples, then again, that's an acceptable approach. But the key to the story point is there's nothing magical about it. It's a relative measure of the amount of work to complete a story. And we simply set what that relative measure is once for the project and we stick to it. And as previously discussed in a previous nugget, the reason we do story points is so that we can determine our team's velocity. And what is velocity? It's the standardized statement of the team's capacity per sprint, i.e. the number of story points that the team can do in an average sprint. And the key to velocity is it has to be developed over time. The first sprint of your project, you're only going to guess what your velocity is, and you're probably going to base it on velocity from previous projects with previous team members, and it should be relatively accurate. But after several sprints, you can determine your velocity because, well, I did 12 story points in the last sprint, and I did 15 in this one, and I did 14 in this one, and I did 13, and we do the adding, summing, and average, and we say, on average, I seem to be able to do 13 story points per sprint. And again, I'm not getting into fractional. I'm keeping everything at a whole number. So I did my averaging out, and I'm being a little pessimistic with my math and saying, I believe at this point in time, my velocity, my standardized statement of my team's capacity per sprint is 13 story points. In absence of having that averaged velocity, the general recommendation is we do our velocity based on yesterday's weather. How many did we do last sprint? So in this case, we guessed and we thought we could do 12. And look at that, the very first sprint we did 12. So we use yesterday's weather as a predictor for the future weather. Could be right, could be wrong. It's no more accurate than saying it was sunny yesterday, so it's going to be sunny today. But in absence of better information, we take that, we go into our next sprint, and we actually find that we were able to add more stories in the latter stage of our sprint, and we got 15 done. So we use 15 as our yesterday's weather predictor. And we go into our next sprint, and we come up a little short, and we're only able to do 14, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's simply the best predictor we have until we're able to get to a standard team velocity. Key message. Velocity is a predictor of a sprint capacity. And as we'll discuss in the next nugget, we have ways of adjusting the stories in a sprint when we're not able to achieve the velocity. So we'll deal with how to adjust it in the next nugget. It is a predictor. It's not a performance measure. Your team should not expect to see on their annual performance review, Steve worked on a project where the team completed the appropriate number of story points at a 70% accuracy or at a 95% accuracy. It's not a performance measure. It should not be on a team's performance review. There will be deviations, as we'll talk about, 
We will discuss in the next nugget how to deal with those deviations, but it is the best predictor we have to use in our sprint planning process. So we've discussed already that determining the story points is relative. The estimating game, I believe, is a really good way of working on the relativity of one story point to the other. And the estimating game goes this way. In part one, we assemble the team. We have all of the stories that are available for estimating set aside. Probably, in my humble opinion, just tacked down the side of our proverbial cork board. And we say, team member number one, pick a story. So they pick the story. They read it out loud. This story involves a office worker doing a job to achieve an outcome. I believe this story is of average capacity, size, effort. So I'm going to put it right here in the middle of my work corkboard. Thank you, team member number one. Team member number two. Do you have any issues with where team member one put that story? Nope, feels a bit right to me. Okay, what would you like to do? And team member number two is going to grab another story, read it out loud. As a warehouse clerk, I need to, to accomplish. Team member number two says, I think this is quite a bit more complex than the previous story. So I'm going to put it over here. There is no discussion. It just allows people to see where it's being placed. It's team member number three, it's your turn. Any issues with how these have been placed? No, nope, you're okay with that, perfect. So team member number three, grab a story. Team member number three grabs a story and says, I as user need to perform to achieve an outcome. Oh, that's a simple one. I'm going to put it over here. And team member four number comes along, grabs a story and puts it, well, I think it's almost the same as that one. I'm going to put it right there. Team member number five, do you have any issues? Yes, I do. I actually think this is more complex than the previous one. So I'm going to remove it from there. So we're actually going to remove it from that location. And we're going to move it over and we put it over here. And that's team member five's turn. Team member six, any issues with the placement? Nope, then you may pick a new story. Team member six picks a story and puts it right here to the left of that relatively complex story. Thank you, team member number six. Team member number one, so we repeat, Team member number one, any issues? Yes, I don't think that story is as complex as team member six thought it was. So I would like to take it off of there and I'll move it back here. And this process continues. We go through team member number one through team member number six. They have the option of challenging or they have the option of selecting and placing. And the estimating game, part number one, continues until all of the stories have been selected and all the stories have been placed in an ascending order of complexity until the entire team is happy and there are no remaining challenges. And that completes our estimating game number one. This is absolutely ranked by complexity. In part number two, we size it. So we take our sizing sequence. So one, two, four, eight, sixteen, for example. And we go back to the first team member and say, your job is pretty easy. This is absolutely our simplest story. So we're going to say 
that story is story point number one. This is our baseline. Thank you, team member number one. Team member number two, please take our next sequence, step up to the board, and tell me where you think the threshold is, where we begin to go to two story point stories. Okay, team member two, thank you very much. Team member number three, would you like to challenge that? No, pretty comfortable with that. Okay, team member number three, pick the next one. Tell us where you think story point number four begins, and so on. And much the same, this continues. The next team member has the choice of moving one of these. I think the two should be moved to here. I think the four should be moved to here or here. Or alternatively, picking the next number and determining that here's our threshold for eight. And let's just say we've been through it and the threshold of 16. And again, we follow the same process. The team member is allowed to challenge or the team member is allowed to select in place until we have our sizing, relative sizing, fully completed and then our estimating game is done. We know our one story point stories, our two story point stories, our four story point stories, our single eight story point, and our single 16 story point story. And we are now fully sized with the team in total agreement. And we are ready for our sprint planning process for our next sprint. Our planning poker game runs much the same, or at least the output of the planning poker game run much the same. We start with all of our stories available and each team member, instead of standing up and ordering, each team member has a deck of cards. Hence the poker aspect, but these are not regular playing cards. These are our Fibonacci cards. So in this case, I'm going with that sequence as opposed to the two exponential. Either method would work. We could also go the one, two, four, eight. And each team member has a complete deck of cards with the numbers one, two, three, five, eight, 13, and 21. Someone, probably the product owner, would stand up and select the first story and read it off. As an office worker, I need to complete X to achieve results. On the count of three, everyone please select from your deck of cards what you believe is the story point effort for that story. So the team members hold up their cards. You get a three, a five, a one, a three, a two, and a five. For example, with our six team members, and you say, well, we're not quite in unison for that. So team member number one, why do you think this is so simple? And they get one or two minutes to explain why they think this story is so simple. And one of the fives get to present why they think it's so complex. And the idea is we pick the smallest and we pick the largest. And when we have a tie for the largest, we simply let one of the two speak. Each plead their case of why they think it's simple, why they think it's complex. We ask the team to put their cards away. And we say on the count of three, hold up your cards. And hopefully this point in time, it's a unanimous three. They're all in total anonymity or anonymity agreement and we take this story and we move it over and we put it in the three slot and we repeat product owner or some non team member reads the next story we do the vote we hold them up we rationalize that we went from a three to a five to an eight to a five to an eight and a 13 we ask the three to present, we ask the 13 to present, they argue the cases, and we vote again. And maybe this time we're a little closer. It's fives and eights, present, present. Hopefully as a result of these discussions, we can get to the point of agreement. And we keep co continuing until we have a five, an eight, a five, a five, a five, a five. 
And if that person can't convince, then we would eventually reach the consensus rules and say the story goes to a number five. Planning poker, estimating game, a very powerful way to reach team consensus on relative, link, relative ranking and story point assignment for all of the stories that need to be estimated. We find the time to run these estimating games to estimate our stories by creating a story called Estimate Stories. We work with the product owner when we realize that there's a significant number of stories that need to be estimated on the storyboard. So we take one of the team stories called Estimate Stories, work with the product owner, says we need to have a story in the next sprint where we'll take the time to run one of our estimating games to estimate these stories to make more sprint ready stories. So again, I, I hope that that comes across clear. Everything we do in a sprint needs to have a story associated with it. So if we need to estimate the stories, we create a story for that very purpose, get it included into the next sprint and include it and therefore do that story in the sprint. This nugget was focused on scrum estimating. Bottom line, spending the time to determine how much effort is required to complete each story that's in our backlog. We determine we're going to create this thing called a story point and a story point is simply a standardized measurement of effort and we use story points as opposed to hours because it's more relative and it provides easier comparison. This story is bigger than the last story so therefore it needs more story points. To try to keep the easy ease of comparisons we suggest we use a, a estimating sequence either the Fibonacci where 3, 5, 8 and so on or maybe a 2 exponential where 2, 4, 8 to give us some degree of spread especially as we move out in our sequences between the number of story points per story so that we don't get into a lot of detailed discussion oh no this is a 2 versus a 1 versus a 3 it's far easier to say it's a 5 versus an 8 because this one is very much of the same size where this one is significantly more effort. We estimate our story points so we can determine the number of story points we can complete per sprint using something called velocity. Story points per sprint which is simply the average number of story points completed in the previous sprints on our project and we use that as part of our sprint plan to determine how many new stories to select. Recognizing that even with the sequencing and even with this degree of relativity that we use with story points that it's still often hard to pick up a story and read it and says oh I know instantly that that is an 8. We introduced a couple of estimating games the estimating game where the team ranks the stories and then assigns the estimate or the planning poker where we do team consensus to assign the estimating size to each of the stories in our estimating story. This concludes our nugget on Scrum Estimating. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.